Good evening, and thank you for making the time to be here. My name is Maxine Lee. I am Accelerator Manager of MAP. Thank you for coming down tonight. For those of you who are new to the program, MAP supports people who are working on startups that will have transformative impact regardless of what company stage you're at. Success for us tonight is that you're inspired to apply from MAP this year, that you feel more informed and confident about going through the selection <coughs> process, and you have the opportunity to connect with people behind MAP, um, the mentors and alumni, and know that there are people here to help, you guide, uh, help guide you through that process. So I'll share a very quick overview about our accelerator. We'll then hear from MAP alumni, Matt Fish, then Jeremy Craybill, our chief entrepreneur in residence, and I will share how we think you can ace this selection process. Most importantly, please stick around for the Mixer at 7.30. We'll get to meet with some of the mentors and the companies that went through our accelerator last year. Uh, quick show of hands, has anyone ever been to a previous MAP application workshop or info session from previous years? couple of you in the room. Great. Um, the structure of selections this year will feel familiar, but hopefully you'll have some new insights about how to put your uh, best foot forward. So the MAP Accelerator portfolio reflects a vibrant and eclectic mix of companies. So you'll see companies on a screen from e-commerce to healthcare platforms and uh, hardware startups and founders from all walks of life. Uh, as for a few examples, we have Brosa uh, on the top row there, which is an e-commerce designer furniture company that came through MAP in 2014. They came in with $20,000 in revenue and spent their time at MAP putting in place growth systems, customer acquisition strategies, which eventually led them to walk out of MAP with $2 million in revenue. They've now raised their $2 uh, million in funding from Airtree Ventures and $3 million from Valador. CNS Dose on the second row is a company focused on a mental health space. So they came through MAP in 2016 with substantial research, but left the program with established partnerships to launch in the US and have positively impacted over 2,000 patients across the world. Relectify, a company in the bottom row, is an energy storage company. They focused their time on MAP on commercializing their product. And they're now working with automotive and power companies across the world, making their mark as the leading second life battery company. You'll be able to uh, read more about our portfolio of companies on the website, so hop on there and check it out. Most of you know uh, that the MAP Startup Accelerator provides $20,000 in funding. We don't take equity in your business. We don't own your IP. But that's really the smallest part of our offering. So why should you be involved with MAP? One of the most powerful things about MAP is the community and the strength of the people behind it. You'll work with a group of founders who will keep you accountable and help you with your momentum as you figure out how to grow your businesses together. MAP also is an extensive mentor network with over 100 mentors, which include people like Amanda Coote, the co-founder of Forever New, Sam Pratt, the VP of Strategy at Unlocked, and more recently, Lucy Liu, the COO of Melbourne's tech darling, Air Wallet. These mentors have experienced building companies and understand firsthand the challenges of what it takes to really grow a business. We have international mentors, such as Mark Johnson, who's sitting in the audience. We have a range of mentors based overseas. They're incredibly general, uh, generous when it comes to helping founders, and they're just a Skype call away. Matt puts our founders first, so you are in the driver's seat, but we will surround you with the right people to help you with your business. There'll be times when we give you tough love, but know that we are on your team. We'll get to know you at the start of the program, work out what your skill gaps are, and get you to a point where you are the leader that you need to be for your company to grow. In addition to the University of Melbourne brand, you will have access to MAP's far-reaching network and the deep connections that we have into industry and with investors. Each year, our founders get to attend the Melbourne Entrepreneurship Gala, a national event where you will sit across the top minds of industry, government, and startups. When it's time for you to raise money, we will be there with you in the trenches, working out a deal that's fair, and introducing you to investors when the time is right. So in terms of eligibility for the accelerator, at least one founding team member uh, on your startup has a University of Melbourne affiliation as a student, alumni, or staff member. Now, even if you don't have this university affiliation, there are other programs at MAP, such as the Velocity Program or the Franklin's Program, uh, which I'll go through at the end of this event. 
Another requirement is that at least one of the founders commits to working full-time on a business at least during the duration of MAP. Because if you're serious about building your company, then your whole team should be on board because you'll get the most learning benefits from being within close proximity to the MAP mentors and the other founders. Um, we understand it's not always easy. You might be studying, you might be the primary carer, you might be doing contract work on the side, but if you're feeling concerned, don't be afraid. Just have a conversation with us so we can work it out together. So I'd actually like to call on someone else up on stage to share their experience. We have Matt Fish from First Step, who went through the program last year. He was sitting exactly in this room 12 months ago. So hopefully he has some valuable insights to share with you about his journey. Please give him a round of applause. Uh, thanks, Maxine. Everyone, my name's Matt Fish. It's great to be here. I'm one of the co-founders of First Step. And as Max mentioned, I was in this room uh, for the last two years, vigorously taking notes and uh, taking it all in. I actually employ you all to do the same. It's a really good session. So um, First Step is a mobile-first micro-investment platform that empowers Australians to save more and to save better. Uh, it's quite simple to use. You sign up in minutes. Uh, set a financial goal and we help you get there quicker by rounding up your spare change and investing that into diversified portfolio as well as helping you invest uh, recurring contributions. Um, it's really helping our customers automatically save money. There's no conscious effort and it just happens in the background of life and they uh, focus on what's important like building a business or, or a startup. Um, the fund's now been live for 12 months. Returns are great. Our most popular portfolio has returned 10.85% since its inception. So we have some happy customers, which is good. And we just launched on the App Store uh, three months ago. So we're run, running live in the moment. So, um, and I will make a, a, give you guys a deal today. Uh, if you sign up with a student email, um, you get the first three months free. So um, just a bit of incentive there if you're keen to start saving. This is our team. Uh, founders at the front. Uh, board at the bottom. Uh, Shiraj will actually be here uh, at the mixer. So if you've got any questions about your business or the process of MAP, feel free to come up to Shiraj and I will happily uh, speak to you and answer your questions. And uh, Lynn and Lisa have come from Scale Investors and we just closed our second round, of, second round of investment with Scale last month, which was great. So the key challenges for First Step when we came into the MAP program included our business model, um, just making sure that the sound improving the value prop, as well as finding a uh, good sustainable distribution model. And uh, MAP really helped us by, uh, by matching us with the right mentors and introducing us uh, to amazing businesses and amazing people within the MAP network. And the program itself gave us some really good structured guidance, uh, which helped us overcome these challenges. Uh, one of the key challenges was testing the right distribution model and the $20,000 um, grant that we received really helped us um, test some important channels, for example, like Facebook, which is really important for a, a B2C type business. Uh, in terms of personal and founder challenges, uh, definitely focus was one and just building a network in the startup community. And uh, MAP was just amazing. Um, it's just really easy to get distracted and lose focus in the business. And there was, uh, we have weekly check-ins and they make sure that the founders and the company is, is on the right track. Um, you define your challenges up front and they really help you overcome them over the life of the, the, the program. Um, look, everyone's startup, I will say everyone's startup is unique, but the challenges are often quite common across the board. Map's seen it all. Um, so listen and, and take their, their advice on board because they really um, give you all the love and attention uh, that you deserve. Um, so how to navigate the selection process. Just make sure you reply if you're ready. Map's amazing, $20,000 in, in co-working space um, surrounded by a powerful network is invaluable. There aren't any tricks. Just clearly articulate your business model, your traction, um, and just your business idea. And always seek feedback from your peers or the people that map through the application process, no matter how confident you are. Uh, show passion for your business, but be approachable. And um, no matter how busy you are, just give the process all the love and attention because that's what it deserves. And if you don't get, get in, don't give up, be persistent, try again. It took first step four goes, and we finally got in despite a really cringeworthy video application last year. <laughs> Uh, when you're in the program, just know what your challenges are from day one. Just take some time to understand what they are. Um, MAP will help you overcome these and it just it makes you right, it makes you ask the right questions from day one. 
go with a mindset to learn. It is a learning process. And just go in, have fun, and go in with an attitude to just make shit happen because it's a really infectious environment and MAP will help you get stuff done. Um, and last point is the power of MAP is in the network. It's amazing. So just take the time to meet as many companies and, and entrepreneurs in the network and, and just learning from others is a great gift. That's my speech. Thank you, everyone. Matt, um, a point to what Matt said earlier, it did take first step four tries, one with a different company and three with first step, but I just want you to know that even if you don't get into the next stage, even if you decide MAP isn't a program for you, we have an open door policy when it comes to giving feedback and helpful introductions that we think will be useful for your business. So uh, it's always an open door, sign up for our open office hours, I'll share the link with you at the end of the presentation, come in and have a chat with the MAP team or alumni. I think um, you'll find the process really valuable. Um, all right, so I'm just going to go through uh, an overview about what the selection stages look like and a bit about our selection criteria before we jump in. So in terms of uh, selection stages, there are four main stages to getting into MAP. Applications are now open. The first stage of selections is relatively straightforward. All you'll need to do is prepare a three-minute video. It doesn't have to be high production value, along with a really short online form. Uh, the challenge here, though, is being able to communicate your business in a span of a three-minute video. It's a lot more uh, harder said than done, so don't leave this application to the last minute, be my advice. If you are successful in your application, you'll be invited to pitch night to pitch in front of our mentors. If you're successful from then on, you'll be invited for an interview with the MAP team and a few of your alumni. Uh, your second interview will be with our selection panel, and this usually comprises a balance of investors and entrepreneurs with MAP in a room. After interviews are done, we usually spend the entire evening coming up with our cohort for this year. If you are selected as one of the MAP, uh, as one of the 10 companies, you will, be, you will need to be in Melbourne for the Accelerator launch on the 30th of May to showcase your pitch. Uh, last year, we sold out for this event with over 800 people in attendance. It's a great opportunity for you to get out there and showcase your business and your team, uh, and it can be an exhilarating uh, way to kick off the program. So these are a few things we look for in a startup, and for the most part, we advise you to structure your pitch to cover these areas. This isn't meant to be prescriptive, and I'll breeze through these because Jeremy is going to be going through them um, in the pitch feedback later. So in no specific order, problem in the market, is there a legitimate pain point that you're solving? What is your approach to market? Um, who are your first 10 customers? How are you going to get there? What is your solution? And what are some data points you can point to to prove that it um, solves the problem for the customers that you're targeting? What's already out there and how are you better? In terms of execution or traction, what is your progress, uh, progress and how is it time bound? So instead of giving us an absolute uh, figure in terms of your revenue, how did your revenue change month on month? How did it grow? And what did you do differently to get to that point? If you're mission driven, how do you measure your social impact and how do you grow your reach to positively affect your beneficiaries? Uh, JK will go through a few examples of traction uh, later. In terms of business model, how do you make money, whether it's from customers or a sustainable uh, funding model? Team is important. We want to know who you are and what about your team demonstrates your capacity uh, to get to the next level. How we can help. This isn't something you need to sell us on, but it is something that we do consider internally. We'll look at your company, what is achievable, what is achievable sorry, in five months, and whether or not you're going to be a good fit. Typically, how we define a startup is a large and high growth business that might not be a large and high growth business yet. And no one is there yet, so don't feel worried. We'll look at your potential and if you have plans to grow quickly. But to us, being a startup has nothing to do with being a stereotypical tech company. And we are very inclusive towards the kinds of companies that we support, whether it's for-profit, non-for-profit, and more traditional um, businesses. And social enterprises. And social enterprises. <laughs> All right, so in terms of your online application, uh, JK is going to go through the pitch part of your online application, but I just wanted to give you uh, a glimpse of the three main questions that you might want to think about beforehand before you, uh, before you go onto the um, web portal. So most of the questions, I think there are about, there are 15 questions in your online form. Uh, most of them will be to collect information about the founders, 
phone numbers, emails, faculty affiliations. But the only three questions that you might want to discuss with your team beforehand are the ones on the screen. So it's really not that complex. So don't worry about submitting a fake application just to see what's on the next page, because I get those. They're really annoying. Um, another thing to note is that we start looking at applications as soon as, as soon as the window opens. Statistically, most of you will leave your application till 11.50, 10 minutes before the deadline. <laughs> but if you want us to spend more time on your application, then submit it, uh, get it in early, get it in out of the way. Cool, uh, all right, now I'd like to call on Jeremy to come to stage uh, to talk about what to include in your pitch. As I mentioned before, Jeremy is our Chief Entrepreneur Residence, mentor at MAP since day one. He's been on a selection panel four times, uh, so he's the best person uh, to speak about how to get through the process. So make sure you're taking notes. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy. I'm going to spend about 15 minutes talking about uh, pitch and sort of how to optimize your chances of having a shot. This is a, it's a competitive situation, and we get a lot of questions about why we use a three minute pitch. It's a pretty common format, but there are reasons that it's very effective for us and we think it's effective for you. I think it's a very worthwhile process for any business to go generating a pitch and practicing, especially a time-limited pitch, because you have to distill what you're doing and what your business is into a very small amount of time. And that actually forces you to think about your business in ways that maybe you haven't previously and why you're doing what you're doing. And for us, it gives us an opportunity in a very time effective way to hear from all of you in terms of what you're doing. And we, we value a large number of applications. Um, and Maxine and myself, among other people, uh, have to watch all of those three minute videos. Um, it's a fun day. All right. So um, there are many resources online that will tell you what a three minute pitch is. A three minute pitch for you is uh, is just how you tell what you're doing in three minutes. This list up here is a common skeletal format for a three minute pitch. It does cover most of the things that we have questions about. And it gives you an idea of how you might want to balance that three minutes of time that you've got. Three minutes is not a lot of time. And so you will be struggling with your script and I would encourage you to develop your script before you develop your slides. I would encourage you to Think about each one of these areas. And so the areas that we're going to go through are introduction, who you are, problem, the problem that you're solved, that, that you are attempting to solve, solution, what you're doing about that, what your business physically, like, like the actual service or product or, or what, what you are doing, the market that you are in, how big is it, where is it, what is it, the business model, how you're going to make money and, and or scale, uh, your sources of funding, etc. Traction, this is a, a confusing term for a lot of people because um, you may not have heard it before, but I, I want to encourage you to think about traction as what has your progress been to date? That's what we're talking about. Competition, who are you up against? Who is your team? Who's executing this? And what are you doing next? These numbers are just suggestions, and many successful pitches do not cover all of these, and some of them spend a very large amount of time on a specific one. You, everyone's doing unique stuff. You may need to spend a minute and a half explaining your problem if you are in a very technical industry that has lots of in and outs. Hopefully, you, you don't need to do that because that will involve cutting down airtime on a lot of these other areas. Some of these that say 30 to 45 seconds may be very brief because you may not have much to talk about or there might be more important things. So you need to figure out for you what you're going to say and in what order you're going to say it. I think there's a lot of things I like about this order. Personally, I think team for certain teams can be right at the front and for other teams can be right at the bottom. I think that for certain teams, like the order of sort of the transition from solution through to the market, the business model, traction, competition, that can be mixed up. Um, but I think this is a pretty good skeleton to start with, a default. Before you go about constructing a pitch, I hope you've watched a lot of pitches. And if you haven't watched a lot of pitches, you should go and watch a lot of pitches. Trying to write a pitch without watching pitches is like trying to write a novel and you've never read a book. It's not easy. Uh, so I would encourage you to do that. We have a lot of resources. We're going to talk about some of them later. Um, so I'm just going to buzz through sort of what we're talking about in each one of these areas. When we're talking about introduction, I want to know who you are. I, that's, I'm Jeremy Crable. I'm with Dashboard. We are an events and marketing solution for Salesforce customers. That's kind of what I'm talking about. I wouldn't spend too much time on it. Sometimes 
You might have uh, like a tagline for your company. You may also say, um, you may have just read about us in the age because we just closed the, the Australia's largest round of funding in history. That sort of thing. If you've got a teaser, that's what we're talking about. Um, if there's something that you really want to advertise, you can talk about it then. Um, the problem that you're solving, so we're talking about a problem, we're also talking about an opportunity. So you need to describe why you exist. Usually that is a literal problem that your customers are facing or your users or who you're dealing with. Um, but sometimes it's more of an opportunity. Sometimes it, it's, uh, you're, you're doing something that, um, you know, you think about like if you invented immortality, like I guess that's solving the problem of death. Um, you could also see it as like just a general positive thing that you bring into the world. So there's different ways to phrase that. And then once you've talked about your problem, you need to explain what your solution is, what you're doing to solve it, what you're doing as a business. If you are in a technical area, and I, I would just encourage you overall with this, um, make sure when you are writing down your pitch and you're explaining the things that you're explaining, you're explaining it to people who, um, in a very plain English sort of way, who may not understand jargon about your industry at all. I would encourage you to drop as much. If you've got long words that are industry specific, figure out a way so that if you're talking to a, an audience of random people off the street, which is one way to sort of, you know, our body of mentors are very diverse in terms of where their backgrounds are, where, where their technical knowledge is. So you want to make sure that you are describing what you're doing in very plain English and in a way that makes it very clear to understand. Um, next, we want to hear about your market. So you've told us about your problem and your solution. We want to know about the market that you are in. And it's very important when pitching a business of any sort to be able to size your market. And there's a lot of information about market sizing. I think we'll, we'll generally get a lot of questions about it. When you read online the literature about market sizing and startup pitches, you may hear terms like TAM and SAM and SOM and uh, all those sorts of terms. We don't really want to hear those in pitches because that's technical jargon that I just spoke about. Um, you can say, if you let's say you are in a, in a business where you're, uh, you've got internal lighting fixtures and you've got some new novel internal lighting fixture that you're selling. Um, it's fine to tell us that like the interior furniture market is a $4 billion market, but that's not your market size. Your market size is about where you as a business and your customers intersect. We get a lot of pitches that say we're doing retail, um, we're doing real estate contract management, for instance. And the real estate industry is a $72 billion global industry. Well, that's not really, if you're doing contract management for real estate, that's not your market either. Your market is what is the size of the market of people who are dealing with contracts in real estate? So you need to get to that sizing. We don't have enough time here to really go through this. This is, this is not a easy thing to do in many cases, but it's very important to size your market. We want to know if, it, if it's growing, if there are non-obvious things about the market, especially things that are positive about it, such as you may think that retail real estate contract management is really boring, but expenditure on real estate contract management has been growing 72% per year for the last five years. Those are the types of things that you want to point out, especially if they're not obvious to the, to the uh, audience. It is extremely important for whatever you say about your market to be accurate. One of the things we're trying to evaluate with this is not who's going to be the next billion dollar company because as a non-commercial um, accelerator, that's not all that we look for. We're looking for interesting people doing interesting things around the university community who can be part of the MAP community. But outside of the sizing of the market, it's very important to us that you understand your market. So if you tell us facts that turn out not to be true and we look into them, and I, I really love, personally, I love fact-checking pitch facts about market. Because there's a lot of interesting things. I, I, we had a pitch a, a, few week, a few years ago that, that said something like, there are 19,000 cafes in the city of Melbourne. Not true, turns out. Really, really far off. And if you're dealing in that market and you say something like that and it's inaccurate, this is a, basically a deal breaker because it means that you really don't fundamentally understand what you're doing. And then why is now the right time? Uh, sort of, you know, if there's anything happening in the market that's changing things, regulatory changes, et cetera, we want to know about those. Business model and growth, I think this is another one you can spend a lot of time online about, but um, we just want to know what is your plan for? How, how do you make money? 
how much are you charging if you know that or, or are you going to be charging? A lot of businesses are, are struggling with things like, are we going to sell a product? Are we going to sell a subscription? Uh, are people going to donate to our uh, not-for-profit or are we going to get sponsorship from corporates, etc.? I would encourage you to pick, even if you are, have some questions in your head about those, sort of put your right foot forward and pitch your current theory. Um, even if it's unproven, because you just don't have time in a three-minute pitch to say, we're choosing between this and this. And, and part of that is really how are you going to grow and scale, and, and so things like margin. Well, you'll get questions about margin and about your cost structure, et cetera, in your interview. Traction. Confusing term. It's just progress. It's progress. It's progress. Hopefully that addresses most of the questions about traction. Um, any form of revenue or funding that you've received is traction. Doesn't matter where it came of money to what you're doing. Um, we we want to know about anything else that's sort of along those lines. So it, wherever you are in your scale of progress, even if you're pre-customer, do you have a prototype? Has it been validated? Have you spoken to people? How many people have you spoken to? Hopefully you're further along than that because there's a lot of people in this room and, and the bar for, for traction with the accelerator program has gone up year on year. So we want to know anything about that. Um, and we don't want it to be too complicated, like sort of focus on the, the things that are matter the most to you um, in, in terms of traction. So don't give us a laundry list. Competition, we just sort of want to know, this is part of sort of knowing the market. We want to know what you're up against. If you have direct competition, what, what are people, how are people solving this problem today is another way to think about it. Don't tell us you have no competition. Everyone has competition. Sometimes competition is the status quo. Sometimes... You, you think about competition in different ways, um, and so we, we want to know really what are you up against and, and how, who else is sort of in this area. And that's a very good thing. It validates what you're doing, but we also want to know that you know about it. And then team, this should be quite short. We, I like to see photos of your whole team, everyone. I like your team to be present when you come and pitch physically. Um, the most... And some people would like to sort of list off a resume. I only want to know about your resume to the extent that it's relevant for what you're doing. Like, don't tell me that um, Jeremy is a sociology major and John has a degree in political science um, if you're doing something in computers. Like, it's just not relevant. Um, if you don't have, like, a direct attachment, you should probably find a way to, to pitch one. I mean, you should be telling us, like, we've been working on this idea together for seven years and we're very passionate about event management or whatever. Um, but hopefully you can say something more along the lines of, um, this is our second event management business. The last one we sold to Eventbrite for $17 million. You know, that, that's like a really, that would be a pretty good thing to say if it was true. Don't say things that aren't true. Um, and then at the end, we want to sort of know what, what's next. Why are you applying a map? Where does the, the funding in this program get you by the end of the program? Very important to convey that to us. We want to, we want to know why you are coming to us and how we can help and where it gets you to in terms of your next milestone. That's also a really important thing down the road, by the way. When you're doing investor pitching, everything about your pitch uh, to an investor is painting a very compelling picture of where this set of resources, the money in most cases for an investment round, will get you by the end of it. So we, we, wanna, we sort of look at it in a similar way. We want to know why are you here, what, what are we going to do to help, and what will you get out of it? Yes. Yes. Uh, could you share some feedback on how to accurately calculate market size from the bottom up as opposed to top down? Oh, yeah, yeah, good point, good point. Um, under no circumstances should anybody say um, sports is a $17 billion industry in Australia, and if we only capture 1% of that, we'll be a $170 million company. Um, we want to know with market size and business model, um, bottom up is what is the term that we use, and what this means is I want to get a picture of like, how are you going to grow? Uh, what you know? How are you distributing your product to people? Do you have to spend a thousand dollars to get five hundred dollars worth of customer revenue, or is it the other way around? So, when you're talking about market size and, and what you're going after, you should really be focused on sort of here's the opportunity. This is it may sound small today, but it's growing, or maybe it's a very large market that has this big deficiency. Um, that, that you know, people are tired of petrol-powered cars, etc. And then we want to know, okay, um, we are going to go after it by partnering with auto dealerships to sell our electric cars to them, etc. So there's again much more that can be said. Sort of, I'm I'm already running uh, dangerously close to time, I think. But maybe we can talk through some questions about that. 
some things to that you should uh, know about. Already talked about knowing your market, getting your facts right. How are you going to make money? Even if you don't have a theory there, you should probably come up with one by the time you apply to math. We really want we want to just know what you're doing, what's going on, and like um, how how will this program help you achieve that style stuff? Uh, I would highly recommend being very enthusiastic. This also means I also highly recommend putting your best foot forward, meaning if you've got a multi-founder startup, I recommend that your best speaking founder should be your speaker. You don't have to do that. We have many, many successful pitches that have gotten in and that we see every year that they split it up two, three, four, five ways. Uh, I think for three minutes, you've got some transaction costs there that you're dealing with. Um, we do want, when you get to a physical pitch, I think everyone from your team should come with you. Try to memorize when it comes to giving your physical pitch. Uh, it, it really helps to not use cue cards, but by all means use cue cards if, it, if it's the difference between giving a pitch and failing miserably. Um, practice, 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 and practice in front of people. And what will happen, which is a very annoying thing, and I, I've been dealing with it for a long time, and I still find it really annoying, is that people give you feedback and it like feels very personal. Because you just spent like 40 hours putting together this three minute pitch. And then like your mom says, um, what the, what's event management or something? And you're like, oh, I think I explained that. Um, you might get stuff that actually is, is like, well, I don't really believe you. You're going to get lots of different feedback. I, I highly recommend that to process that feedback effectively when you get it. Do not debate it. Don't respond to it. Just say thank you and write it down and sort of let it sink in and then go away from it and then like later come back to it and sort of think about this is valid feedback everyone's feedback is valid because they are an audience member and and you are pitching to an audience so uh you should look at it and figure out how to work an answer into your pitch so we have a few things that you must 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 not do most of this, this, everything else we've been talking about is advice. These are things that if you do it, you're going to be not, not we're not going to be happy with your video. Um, no music, unless you're a music startup, maybe, uh, or a band or something. Um, so no music of all, of any kind. No animations of any kind, unless you're an animator or uh, something like that. Um, but please don't use like a Prezi style presentation uh, and with animated figures and like a voiceover, um, it, it is not effective. And, and so we've effectively banned it. Um, don't speed up your audio. Every year someone does something else that we never thought of before. And last year we had a whole bunch of people who like had a 345 pitch that they just crunched down into three minutes and they sounded like the chipmunks. Um, <laughs> don't do that. And I feel like we're using, oh, and don't use robot voices. Don't use machine-generated audio, unless you're a machine-generated audio company. Um, so don't, don't do that either. Is there anything, anything else we should ban? Oh, don't do live demo. Don't bring in a product on pitch night and like try to show it to the audience. Um, you can like bring something and set it aside so that we can physically see it, but this is, there's no demos. This is not a demo. Or video. And oh yes, no video really of any kind. And again, unless you were a video company, uh, and even then you should probably be talking over the video, not saying, now we're gonna watch two minutes and 45 seconds of our last commercial. In terms of your interviews, your first interview will be a 40 minute-ish interview with the Matt team and our alumni. And the second one, as I mentioned before, is a uh, 20 minute interview three minutes of which will be spent pitching your company, 17 minutes for Q&A. So just uh, notice how there's a lot more time in the first interview and that you're going to be really short on time for the second one. So be sure to come prepared and keep your responses concise. Um, so in terms of uh, the interview, I think Jeremy's already covered this point. Make sure you have all of the data that you need on the day. Be prepared with any case studies or important metrics for your business. That varies depending on what kind of business you're in. Um, uh, let us lead. So again, if someone gives you feedback and says, actually, I don't agree with the whole way you're approaching this, you should do X, Y, Z instead. Instead of trying to justify your own answer, just say, thank you for the feedback. We'll take into consideration. 
and wait for the next question. Because again, in the second interview especially, you won't have enough time to go back and forth with the, um, with the panel. Uh, keep it real. If you don't know the answer to something, if uh, someone on the panel asks you to uh, talk about a market size that you don't have the data on you, and you don't have that data on you, just say, look, I don't have that answer available right now. Be happy to check in with you uh, once I've done the research and, and get back to you about that. Uh, also, don't be afraid to tell us what you've learned and what you've learned from doing things wrong. So if you've made, and we've all done it, right? We've all made mistakes in how, um, uh, whether it's how you approach a customer that was wrong, it was an advertising campaign that went, that went badly, a prototype that had some flaws. It's okay to share that kind of stuff. Uh, we just want to learn what you learn from it. Um, at the end, work together. Jeremy's mentioned this point. Practice the grilling beforehand. So if you have a really critical friend or colleague, get them to question the assumptions that you have behind your business. Don't be afraid to, um, because we're obviously going to grill you on the types of assumptions that you had, you've made about your business. So don't be concerned. Just practice. Practice with your team. Practice with other companies, uh, and you'll be all right. And most importantly, just relax and have fun. So when you go into the interview room at the final stage, you will be presenting up front. There'll be a boardroom in front of you and a lot of intimidating faces that you're, uh, you're going to face. Just treat it like a conversation and dialogue. We have your best interests at heart. No one's there to attack you or put you down. Um, just have a lot of confidence and you'll be okay. I had mentioned watching pitches. Um, an excellent resource, which I think is the best set of pitches we've put out in a, in a single group, is on the... Map Uni Mel YouTube channel, we've got our 10 pitches from our launch last year. They're the 10 companies that went through last year. And in these pitches, as a group, they are by far the best pitches that we produce. I think that's been the case every year for us, but this is the most, represent, re, most representative set of pitches that you should look at in looking at what's a good pitch. One thing you'll notice about these videos is it's kind of hard to see the, the slides because it's like a, it's a video on a stage like this, so they're not the application videos, but these people spent months working on their pitches throughout the program last year. Um, what you say is much more important than what's on the screen. So the slide feedback we're about to give you is good. You should have a good presentation. Um, not necessary for the application video. Your application video can just be speaking into a phone, um, or it can be something worse than that, like Matt, Matt's application video. Um, but uh, we, we, we care about what you're saying, not what's on the screen as much. When you do a physical presentation, I think your slides can matter. If you're in something like a branding type, uh, an organization where branding and design matter, then your slides really need to look good. For most other people, think of them as an aid to getting your message across. I actually wanted to jump in with a few questions that have been posted on Slido. So Jeremy, people are very curious about why you haven't worn the same. <laughs> um, if anyone doesn't know what this is about, so for the past five years, four years at uh, this application workshop, I've worn the same shirt. And the first year we used Slido was the second time I'd worn that shirt. And our, our top voted question was, is that the same shirt Jeremy wore last time? And so I, I wore it again and again uh, as a joke. And uh, today at a client meeting, it's a short sleeve shirt, and so I ended up wearing this. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll wear it next year. <laughs> yes, absolutely available for international students. If it happens to be after you finish your course, please just make sure you have a visa. Uh, actually, it's the internal temperature of the chicken that matters more than actually, the oven temperature. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It uh, depends on what kinds of skill sets you're looking for. We have a newsletter that goes out to over five, 7,000 of you now, 7,000 people. So if you have any uh, uh, job ads that you want to put out once you're in the program, happy to do that. We also have a program called the Tech, uh, sorry, Tinelli Beta Program, which links uh, tech talent into the companies that come through the program. So another great resource for you to look forward to. Easy one for me. Uh, for me, it's CNS Dose, uh, went through the program two years ago. Yeah. Their pitch, not only was it just a, a very well put together pitch, mm -hmm. it is by far the, uh, of all pitches that we see, occasionally you see pitches where they're pitching changing the world. CNS Dose 
has a pitch that you believe they're going to change the world, and they actually are changing the world. And for, from all of the startups that we've had through, um, this is just an unbelievable product and company. This is, um, if you need to be prescribed antidepressants, you go to your doctor, you get a mouth swab, the doctor gets a report telling which drug at which dosage is most likely to be more most effective for you. Um, and they have multiple published research showing it uh, to be at least as triple as effective as status quo, which is kind of whatever the doctor sort of prefers personally. I think my favorite pitch would be the Brosa pitch at the Map 14 launch. So unfortunately, it is a one hour a video, which you'll have to scroll through. I think they went last. But um, I think what was really convincing about that pitch was the amount of domain knowledge that Ivan actually had about his product and his customers and what they learned throughout that journey. Um, so check out some of the launch pitches as well. Uh, they might be in a different format, but I think it'll be useful. Cool. Uh, so we're going to go through a few examples of map company slides, what we like and what we don't like. We'll obviously have different opinions. First slide we have from Simple Pharmacy, and this is an example problem slide. Why I like this slide is because there's a lot of negative space. There isn't too much on it. And when Lee was presenting the slide at the showcase, we were focusing on more of what he was saying versus what was on the slide. I should say, I think two by two competition charts can be a useful tool. What I get tired of is everyone submits one with you in the top right, everyone else in the other, in the other quadrants, and sometimes these two axes are picked to be like, like we had a joke, uh, Abina had a great two by two comparison for Shaki where one axis was housiness and the other one was tininess, or the tiny house business. So if it's legit, if, if this is legit and this is currently the case, awesome. For the people who are the state of planet map, when I see this, I'm like, BS, usually. So I like seeing, I like seeing two by twos where you're not the whole way at the top right, where there's people around you. I like seeing it where those two axes are things that I think are the most important things. Uh, I don't like seeing cherry picking where you just, there's no one else up there. Like, really? Okay. This is another way you could do it, but again, um, obviously having yourself as the only uh, product or solution that satisfies all the ticks, tick all the boxes, probably not as realistic, but... Um, it's but it's, it's better. It's better than putting yourself at the top right because this what, is what, what you think then? sets you apart. And hopefully it does set you apart. And in the case of Neura, it worked. Biggest Kickstarter in Australian history. So if you're going to, I think that this at least describes, but also, you know, there's got to be other differentiators for the other guys too. Maybe put that in there and say, mm -hmm. well, you know, Sony thinks it's the wings on the headphones. We don't do that or whatever. Don't take yourself too seriously. Please. But don't necessarily put pictures of your dogs in there. That's just an example. <laughs> Right, example to wait for it. Oh, hey, Matt, this is your slide from the showcase. Uh, I like it because it shows a visual roadmap of what life is like uh, at this stage, what you can achieve during that and after the program. I don't like it because it's got a little bit too much stuff going on. Okay, it's fine to talk through, but the icons, I find it just a little bit too much. Maybe if it was larger, maybe a couple of those icons were out. For those of you who have sat through the presentation and decided, oh, what, what else does Matt have to offer? We have a couple, a couple of other programs which are open to the public. Our master classes are one hour practical workshops. We have the Velocity program, which is a fantastic part-time accelerator. As for earlier stage founders, it's still competitive and there are 20 positions available this year. We'll send more information about that in full of comms. Our female founders program called the Franklins uh, provides practical guidance for high, high potential women. And beyond your time in the program, if you go through the accelerator, Matt will support you throughout your career for alumni community. If you are a founder committed to social impact, whether it's embedded in your product or end users, the way you do business, we have a whole range of experiences and content for impact focused founders across all the programs at Matt. There are some really uh, other Cool things happening at the university at the Wade Institute, which is a fantastic Masters of Entrepreneurship program comprising highly practical courses and industry access for early stage founders. We also have the Translating Usage at Melbourne program, which is another great sister program co-located with that, and they provide structured support to researchers who are looking to commercialize their ideas. Talk to another founder, talk to someone in the MAP team, one of our mentors, the alumni will all have orange lanyards on so you can easily identify us. Don't be shy about pitching your business. If you have any specific questions, 
Phil, so don't be shy about getting to know some of the other founders because uh, who knows they'll be able to support you throughout this process. Well, I think when you talk about idea versus team, there's actually more fa many more factors than that. I think a way to look at it is um, we're looking at the whole picture. And what that means is sometimes we see great teams with real, not great ideas. They don't seem like they're going to go anywhere. And other times we see like what appears to be a great idea, but it's like in biotech and it's a couple like computer science people working on it. So, we look at the whole picture. I, they, they all matter, um, and I think great team plus great idea is, is really what excites us. Definitely not. There were plenty of companies that came through last year without revenue but showed customer validation and speaking to users, um, having people on their platform, not necessarily making money at that point. I wouldn't actually... Uh, Answer that question is no, but we've got some. I've got some reservations around that. I think there is a bias towards showing progress and traction, and a very easy way to show progress and traction is if you've got people paying you money for the thing that you think they're going to pay you money for. It's a huge point of validation. So having revenue is very important. If you don't have revenue, it doesn't mean you're not going to get the map. It means we need to look for other ways to believe your story, and you need to pitch that in your pitch. We're looking for other indicators, and there are many ways to get those indicators. And if you look at the teams who have gotten in the map pre-revenue in the past, that number has gone down over time. It's gone down over time because the overall bar for traction and proving your message and how solid your, your, your pitch is has gone up. It's not because we've moved towards a revenue-based model. It's because this program has gotten a lot more competitive. Um, but if you don't have revenue, you, you need to figure out another way to prove. If you're at the stage where you're kind of just two people and an idea, um, you have a lot of work to do between now and applying the map if you want to get in this year. You, you, you really can't get in with just an idea. A couple people, we need more than that. Definitely traction. Um, so just talking about revenue, we actually weren't earning revenue, but as the pitch went on, we were demonstrating traction more clearly. And for us, we had early access users wanting to sign up to the apps. No, don't yeah. do it. It doesn't help. It, it never works. We don't care. It actually never works during pitch night. Something goes wrong, there's a technical glitch, and then it's all over. And, and I would just also say screenshots and what your app looks like and how it does its thing are much, much less important than the thing that you're achieving as a business. And so we see way too many screenshots, way too many people trying to, like, I do a lot of office hours, and people are like, the very first thing they sit down is just, oh, here, here's, here's the app, and I'm going to click around. Like, Okay, well, it's an app that does uh, investment. I, I know how it works, you know. Like, um, we want to know about the business, not about the app. The chances of you getting an app if you have zero funding, uh, funding is, is really not, it's a point of traction, but we, I think actually having funding can be a detractor from a program like MAP because maybe you're too far along for us to help you. So I wouldn't be worried about that at all. In terms of if you're just at a prototype stage and you haven't really validated that prototype or you don't have evidence that this is going to work or you don't have something else in your pitch, we need another element that makes us believe the story that you're telling us, which is that tons of people are going to be knocking down your door to use this thing. Um, so we're really for evidence. If you just have a prototype and you've just been working in the garage for six months and never have spoken to customers, that's a problem. We want, to, we want you to be able to translate what you are seeing or hearing, even if you're not selling products, uh, into your pitch. So we have funded solo founders. You will be put up against a whole different set of challenges. And that's not only uh, to do with the skill sets that you have on your team, but it's also how you distribute the workload. Um, we had a founder, Kettle, um, who is CEO of Delicio, come through in 2017. And 2016, sorry, and I saw three, three, yeah, and, and he was working around the clock. He'd be the first one in and then the last one in the office. I would say this question comes up a lot, and I think it's in the startup literature that's out there mm -hmm. because for commercial accelerators and investors, solo founder is a huge risk. If that person gets in a car accident, the business stops. We care less about that, but the single point, no, we don't care less about you getting in that car. 
<laughs> or your business stopping. But from a financial risk perspective, you know, that's not as, it, it's not as like, uh, we just lost our, our, our whole investment because of this. Um, we do look at the single point of failure thing, though, and, and I think you need to look at it as a solo founder, too. You are a single point of failure if you're a solo founder, and you need to figure out ways to deal with that and make it work for you. So I think there's things that you need to worry about. Um, if you look at track record of solo founders getting in, I'd actually, I would guess that solo founders as a group have been overrepresented in that, meaning the percentage of solo founders who applied and then the ones who got in uh, it, it's larger percentage got in than the ones who applied. Just because we don't see that many, we had like three in one year, um, so I wouldn't be too worried about it. But you, you are pitching around that. I mean, you got to tell the whole story.